Welcome to episode 125. This is amazing of Silver Lining for Learning. And today we got a very, very special guest, uh, Ron Beghetto from Arizona State University. Uh, I must confess, Ron and I have worked together on many different things, uh, we, including traveling to China. Okay, so that was a while back when you were at University of Oregon. But today, the reason we are here is to talk about two issues of uh, the Journal of uh, Review of Research in Education, which highlighted two big topics, which has not been typically in a prominent in educational research journals. The first one is uh, creativity. And the second one is the side effects of education. So last year, Ron and I co-edited uh, the first issue of RRE, for AERA on creativity. And then we are right now uh, collecting and soliciting submissions of proposals for side effects in education, which will be published in 2024. So uh, welcome, Rang, and why don't you do an introduction of yourself? Uh, you know, I think it's better than I do. I do it. Well, I'll keep it brief. Um, it's an honor to be here on such a landmark show, right? 125. That's a congratulations to the crew on that. That's impressive. Uh, my name is Ron Baghetto. I'm a professor in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a co-editor of the Review of Research and Education. I'm also an editor for the Journal of Creative Behavior and a Springer book series, um, Creativity, uh, thought and action in education. And so it's uh, great to be here to talk about uh, the themes of our issues, the one that's already published, and then our upcoming issue. So Ron, uh, why don't you uh, give us um, a summary of what, what do you think we have learned from editing that issue called democratizing creative educational experiences? Yeah, so I think um, prior to the learning, maybe providing a little bit of context might be helpful. Uh, we were thrilled that AERA wanted to uh, run with this topic because creativity is something that really hasn't had much of a presence um, in a lot of educational journals. So I think one of the things that we might ask ourselves is, you know, why creative educational experiences? Um, how are they similar or different than traditional or prototypical educational experiences? What do they offer? Um, when are they beneficial? Um, what are potential drawbacks? And then what does it mean to, to democratize these kinds of experiences? So I think uh, if we kind of step back a little bit and look at the prototypical educational experience, the way I've been kind of thinking about it recently is that, you know, if we talk about the goals of education, there's a lot of debate and, and disagreement, but I think most people agree that education really is about preparing young people for the future. But I feel like education has kind of made this Faustian pedagogical bargain, if you will. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, um, as futurists remind us, there isn't one future, there are multiple futures. And so education has kind of staked out um, doing work in, I would argue, likely futures. So what do young people need for the foreseeable future? And I think that's kind of reasonable on the surface. Um, we want to prepare people for what we can kind of predict they might need. Um, and so in that case, if we're doing that, it seems optimized to give young people experiences, learning and being able to do things that we already know and know how to do. <laughs> and so in school, the prototypical, I would argue, um, model for success is learning how to meet ex expectations in expected ways. Creativity is different than that. Creativity is often about meeting expectations, but in an unexpected ways, and sometimes coming up with new expectations. So you can see there's a little bit of a mismatch there. But again, if I think we broaden this lens and think about multiple futures, then um, possible futures are futures that um, have a lot of uncertainty around them. And so how well are we preparing young people to navigate and, and productively contribute to uncertain futures I think the prototypical experience gives something of that. Uh, they, you know, providing young people with skills that they likely will need will prepare them to navigate uncertainty. But I think this is where creativity steps in. The time we need to be creative is when we don't know what to do, when we don't even know what the problems are. Um, so when, you know, our typical forms of reasoning break down, that's when we need to think and act in new ways. And so 
as we know um, in education, the only way to get experience and doing something is to actually have the opportunity to do it. And so I, I just feel like we haven't given young people an opportunity to experience uncertainty in, in kind of structured and supportive ways so that they could develop their confidence and competence creatively producing new problems to solve, new ways of solving them, producing new kind of creative artifacts. And that's what a creative educational experience is about. It's really requires that it has, I would say four features. One is there needs to be some open-endedness. There needs to be some to be determined elements. So the prototypical environment, everything's predetermined. The problems are already solved, the processes, we know what the outcomes are gonna be and the criteria are already specified in advance. A creative educational experience would open up at least one of those four elements. So allowing young people to identify their own problems to solve, maybe their own ways of solving them, their own way of producing that knowledge, and sometimes even determining the criteria for success. So open-endedness is key um, to a creative educational experience. Also non-linearity, right? There's multiple ways to arrive at outcomes and goals in the prototypical school experience. Everything's doing the same thing in the same way at the same time, trying to write, arrive at the same outcome. But we know from creative educational experiences that often there's starts and stops, there's zigs and zags. Persistence is often good, but so is pivoting. So sometimes it's great um, when a student's been working on something, but they hit an impasse to know when to set that down in, in order to pick up and pivot and do something different, right? So that's part of the process as well. Also plurality perspectives, creativity thrives in difference, not sameness. So the prototypical schooling experience often privileges sameness, creativity requires difference. So again, meeting expectations in different ways, um, allowing different perspectives to come in. And then ultimately a future orientation, really focusing on bringing something new into being that isn't already there. That could be surprising for teachers and and even experts, right? So as you see young people partnering with people who have deeper domain knowledge and skills, they oftentimes can produce things that are surprising. So this is something that I think educators have some awareness of, but it's often not represented in this place called school. And wherein it is represented, it's usually in an extracurricular or maybe even extra extracurricular program or in gifted education programs. And so what we were trying to do with this issue is say, you know, this is good for all young people. If we're really going to get serious about preparing young people for the future, we have to provide all young people with opportunities at every age level to engage with uncertainty in creative and productive ways. So I'm going to stop blathering on, and I'd be interested to hear your responses to well, that. Thanks, uh, Ron. Uh, Chris uh, has a comment or question. Chris, go ahead. So first, I'm really happy we're talking about creativity. And in honor of today, I wore my one of my Halloween Jerry Garcia ties. Love he was it. very creative, both as the lead guitarist for The Grateful Dead and, and as an artist, uh, particularly an artist of ties, as Kurt knows from having a partial collection. Um, so my, my definition of creativity, and I'm not saying this is a universal definition, is open-ended design under constraints. So there's sort of a paradox at the heart of creativity. So Jerry was very creative in his Halloween ties, but the constraints were that there are archetypes associated with Halloween and people expect to see those. The tie is a very limited landscape, right? You have to, whatever you convey has to be, you know, sort of narrow and tall. And um, I think in general, um, creativity often has that kind of paradox. We can do things that are wildly open-ended, um, but great art is great because on the one hand, it's innovative, but on the other hand, it speaks to an audience and, and resonates with an audience. And it's easy to produce something that's wonderfully open-ended, but that nobody but you can make any sense out of. Yeah. So, so I don't know what you think about that kind of tension, but I think that's one of the hard things about helping young people to be creative is that it's not just creative. As you framed it, it's, it's creative in the service of, of doing constraints that involve doing something useful for others. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Chris. And yeah, to be clear, 
So creativity studies have been going on for more than 100 years, and like, there's no universal definition, but there is consensus in the field. And I think one of the probably uh, most uh, problematic things has been slogans like think outside the box, which implies no constraints. So I always say you need to understand and probably quite intimately the interior contours of the box before you can think creatively outside of it. But in most cases, in particular in educational settings, it's really about thinking creatively inside the box. So the definition of creativity that, that I would argue most creativity researchers adhere to is a combination of originality or uniqueness and newness and, and it's a multiplicative relationship, so you absolutely need both, and doing something that's meaningful, that meets criteria, that's useful, that's applicable, and that can be defined by the person themselves or a variety of different audiences from every day all the way on to kind of legendary where it's out of the hands of the creator. But absolutely, creativity always occurs in constraints. We're always operating under constraints. And so that's what differentiates creativity from originality. Originality is halfway to creativity. And what I, when I work with educators, the good news is educators are already halfway to creativity because they've already specified probably overspecified the constraints. <laughs> and so now it's really about how can we work differently within those constraints? How can we still meet the criteria, but in different ways? So yes, creativity is always constrained. Another simple way of defining it would be constrained originality. That's creativity. So thanks, Rung. Um, you know, I, I was going to jump in, but Kurt has a question. Go ahead, Kurt, you, 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 you can ask a question Kurt, and uh, go ahead. Um, so we need to clarify something here because you had four points that you wanted to make and people who are going to watch this later are, are not going to have those numbered. So I, I want to at least get those numbered for them who, who watch the show later. The first one is open-endedness. Was the second one the identification of problems to solve? And the third one being nonlinearity and the fourth one being uh, plurality of perspectives and difference? Or was one and two combined and you just missed one of the four? Okay, so um, those four are markers of what my colleague Vlad Glavin and I call markers of a creative experience. Open-endedness is the first, non-linearity, plurality perspectives, and future orientation. Oh, future was, a, was the last yeah. one. Oh, okay, thank, and thank so, you. And again, as to Chris's point, and that always and already operates within a constrained context. Right. So I'm curious, and I'm gonna throw us off on a totally different tangent, Ron, just because I know you and I've, you know, uh, truth be told, if people watching the show, Ron was uh, was at Indiana University in, in our grad program in Ed Psych, and I had the privilege of of supervising him when he was a young person um, teaching for us uh, undergrad Ed, Ed Psych courses. He's still young, okay? So yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> our, our award our award winning in, um, AI is back. I'm um, glad to see you. And I'll also say that yesterday, Chris, I wore two Jerry Garcia ties for dinner. I had one on. I was trying to impress some people saying I there's some memories with that one that I had another one in my pocket I wore the second one after um so yeah I, I appreciate the creativity and all of Jerry Garcia ties so Ron you know your career you were at Indiana and then at UConn and then at Oregon and at now at ASU all of those places were places where you could flourish in terms of the study of creativity UConn's been, people have been studying creativity. They're, they're well known for it. I mean, Jonathan Plecker was, got his degrees there and went back there and, and there's others there. And the same with that in Indiana. And, and I'm assuming Oregon was, a, a, was also a, a place where you found people you could resonate with and do research with. And of course, ASU is, you know, got your innovation dean right there below on the screen there, Punya. Um, so, you know, they're, they're trying to foster innovation among faculty. Uh, my question is, were you purposely seeking out your learning environments? And if so, what could you tell others about structuring their own environments so they can flourish? How are you, you know, what were you looking for when you moved from place to place to place? What were the components? What were the elements? What, what were the features that enable faculty to be creative at UConn or at Oregon or at ASU or at IU? Yeah, that's a really good uh, point. Just so to be clear, though, so my first appointment was at the University of Oregon as an assistant professor, and Oregon's certainly a very creative place, for sure, uh, the, and Eugene as well. 
My particular, uh, the, the College of Ed, when I arrived, uh, was more focused on behaviorism, interestingly enough. <laughs> and I remember this very anxiety-provoking meeting I had with my then department head and dean, who basically said creativity is dead. And they kind of challenged me to take down that big AERA program guide and find the word creativity in there anywhere. And it wasn't in there. I couldn't find it. And so they were kind of saying, maybe you should think about pursuing something else because it doesn't seem like this is a, this is kind of a viable area of research um, in education, which caused a lot of anxiety for me because that was kind of my passion. So I remember going to AERA and um, I, I was able to present at a little round table and there was a researcher there by the name of Jane Pierdo. And I was kind of telling this story that, you know, I guess, you know, I'm not going to get much support here at Oregon studying creativity. I just had this really kind of anxiety provoking conversation. And Jane Pierdo reached across the table and grabbed me by my cheap little coat jacket and said, if you believe that crap, you're dead. Creativity is not dead. You need to lower your head and do the work. And either you will do the work and it'll be meaningful and they'll recognize it there, or you can go somewhere else where they do recognize it. And what I realized in that moment is sometimes you have to find fellow travelers who aren't in your local context, but they're out there. And sometimes what you thought was going to be a creative place isn't initially. And she was ultimately right. Once I started doing the work, then they were supportive. And then, of course, um, Young joined and, and we kind of hit it off. <laughs> He's a very creative individual. But Yes, I think you have to find fellow travelers and there are, you know, and sometimes it might be discouraging, but I think there are folks out there that you can, can you work with? And I think that's an important piece is creative collaboration doesn't necessarily always mean literally collaborating, but having fellow travelers who um, can commiserate with you, who can support you, who can connect you with people who you can do the work with. So Oregon was kind of a, a shocking experience for me as a, as a junior faculty member. And then, of course, yes, UConn um, was very, um, very ab straightforwardly advocating for creativity and innovation and, of course, Arizona State. Um, but early in my career, it was this kind of moment of do I let go of this piece of my identity and pursue something else or do I persist? And I was able to persist and, and find fellow travelers who assisted me along the way. Before Young jumps in here, could you label three or four aspects of the ASU environment that fosters creativity? You know, what if you had, you know, what grabs you to come to ASU and, and and to move from a place like Oregon? Yeah, I think one of the, I think the key ethos at ASU that really struck me is this idea of use inspired research, which kind of goes back to my family, I'm a first generation college student. I remember when I was going to graduate school, my grandmother just took my hands. I thought she was going to say, we're proud of you for going on to graduate school. But she said, don't you work, Ronnie? I said, what? She said, "There's no, your hands are so soft. You have no calluses. Are you ever going to do anything with them? I'm like, well, they're on my brain, Nanda, of course. And she said, I think they're on your bottom. You know, you, you're not doing any work. Um, so how, how can you take ideas and put them to use? And that's, that's an ethos that's at ASU, but also at ASU, when you have an idea, um, and even when I was visiting ASU, it's not just like, oh, that's great, you know, let's support you in doing that. It's always, what can you do more with that? How can you have an impact? So it really does have an impact focus, which I thought was really um, appealing both to challenge and also kind of evoke a responsibility, that we have a responsibility to do something with these ideas. So I think that's the difference between imagination and creativity. Imagination is you can generate really interesting ideas, but creativity is really about the responsibility to put those into the world and test them out and hopefully make a positive impact. Are you an Indiana guy? Born and raised? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I wasn't. I, no, I'm, I actually uh, grew up in Wyoming. Okay. The railroad brought my family. It was to actually Wyoming. born and raised in China. That's how. how <laughs> I'm in India. Uh, and Sonia, right. go ahead. Yep, yep. Thank you. So, uh, Ron, I, I love the way you set the context up for schooling and and creativity and the whole idea of constraints. In fact, just used uh, that thinking inside the box quote somewhere in a piece we were just writing <laughs> recently. I remember um, because I think when we did the tech trends interview, you had mentioned that, and I 
sort of put it in some paper that actually just got submitted this week. Anyway, um, I want to go back to that the RRE um, special issue. Um, we had uh, which episode? I don't remember. This was episode. Let me see. Uh, 115, where we actually had Laurie Patton Davis, Diego yep. Roman, and Gracias Perez, and I think one more person whose name I'm missing right now as guests on the show. And I usually don't blog the SLL episodes on my website because it's like it's happening every week. I mean, why do that? But there are a few episodes which stand out, and that was one conversation that really stood out for me because it sort of dove into things that in creativity research, we often have not talked much about, which is this sort of deep connection to culture. Yeah. Um, and the and, and the point that I think Chris raised, you know, which is that, you know, that that you can create something which is deeply rooted in a culture, but then can have wings. And, you know, uh, the example I give is of jazz, uh, which is a musical form, which is deeply connected to the African-American uprootedness slave experience, but in some ways has managed to, I mean, there's a playlist on my iPad here, which is called Bollywood Jazz. And it's some of the most amazing pieces of music you will hear. And so it connects to something deeply human, even though it is deeply rooted. And in fact, one can almost argue that when you have more superficial um, sort of creativity, which is not rooted in culture, and context that you actually don't get things that have legs and can move across boundaries, cultural, national, whatever it may be. And so maybe I would throw this question to the two of you actually, because you edited that special issue to tell us a little bit about how that special issue, if it transformed your thinking in some ways, I think Zhao has alluded to that um, and what you felt that it contributed to the larger conversation around creativity that was lacking before that i mean did things change in your mind about it and so on right whatever your yeah. reflection Can on I, that process. Uh, let, let me jump Please. in first uh, uh, Please. you know one of the things both ron and i really kind of uh, had trouble with is uh the overpopulation of uh, meta-analysis you know you look at another aere journal it's called rer review of, of educational research that's a monthly journal they publish almost exclusively on meta analysis. In a lot, I have had a question about meta analysis. So, so when we when you are doing a review article, this is again it's called review of research in education. It's a summary. It's 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 a foreseeing the future. It's what's past. So it was very difficult, you know, for us in the beginning to say how do you stick to say so called methodologically scientific, but you know the content may not be that cool, you know. So I think we. When we received those proposals, we were really impressed. And I, I was completely blown away by, by that perspective, Pony like you. I mean, I was said, oh God, I got, you know, there are several others too. So, so we want run and we made a decision to say we wanted us to be cutting edge. Since this is the first perhaps only issue in education, we wanted to, to raise questions. We want people to be surprised. And so so that's really, I think it was it was really revolutionary for me in thinking about what creativity is. I was, you know, even though I was born and raised in China, my original view of creativity was very much aligned with the Western view of creativity. And I'm Western, I mean, the white middle class, you know, suburban uh, view of creativity. So that was really a very powerful uh, bunch of articles that awoke me. I don't know how well they will necessarily translate into other fields. I hope people read that. I just posted the uh, the journal or website and people can still access those articles. Ron, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I really do invite your, your viewers and listeners to take a, a close look at that issue. And, and it really was transformative to me as well. And Young and I, we did have this conversation because, you know, I think the field of creativity studies is still a pretty small field of researchers who, you know, frequently contribute to it. So we really did try to design the call for proposals to be kind of a creative experience in and of itself, to have this kind of plurality of perspectives, to really be open to new methodologies. And, and we do have folks that have worked in creativity studies contributing to that volume, but we also have folks that haven't contributed to the typical creativity studies journals, but offered perspectives that were really kind of broadening to my own 
conceptions of creativity and thinking about that in the context of education, including methodologies, right? More speculative methodologies, rethinking what kinds of methodologies might be helpful and recognizing what has already been kind of a creative educational experience, but maybe hasn't been seen in that light before. So I think that issue offers so many different entry points for people to think about creativity. And I think it just serves as a reminder that creativity is something, again, is not something that, you know, people often ask, can you teach creativity? But it's not something that needs to be taught. It's a human um, aspect of, of flourishing and survival. It goes, it's kind of a survival imperative. So all humans already um, think and act in creative ways in their own context, um, sometimes for survival, sometimes for joy and, and to contribute to others, sometimes for themselves. And I think that issue does represent a much broader um, horizon of possibilities for what creativity and education could look like. And in and of itself is an effort to democratize creative um, experiences in education. So I, I, I really do, not just because I'm a co-editor, invite people to take a close look at that, but because I think it will challenge assumptions and broaden perspectives if you're open to it. All right. Thanks, Ron. Chris, Thank you. you have a comment? Thank you. Well, I, I want to emphasize that while people pay lip service to creativity, many people, in fact, don't appreciate creativity. Mm. And, and when it happens to them, they're not very happy about it. Uh, one of the things I show my students a few years ago, there was a Humvee commercial. Humvees are modified military vehicles that are good at going off road. And this was a little fictional story about a kid who wants to enter a soapbox racer um you know thing which is soapbox racers don't have a motor they just go downhill and the, it it outlined a course you know kind of back and forth across the hill and first across the finish line wins well this kid built a humvee like soapbox racer and everybody's making fun of him and then he doesn't go along the course he just goes straight down the hill and knocks everybody else out you know and they're all outraged cheater you know but but actually in terms of the rules of the of the thing he's he's being very creative i i would say that i've had to be careful um to kind of constrain some of my creativity because if i get too far ahead of my time people are just sort of threatened by it they don't they don't see the value they just see it as being kind of weird and so you know it's I think part of creativity education also is recognizing that while everybody says, oh, yeah, I love people that are creative in practice, maybe not so much. Chris, yeah, I, I think, it, Chris, yeah, you, you're right. You know, we, we've seen a lot of times, you know, like teachers say, you know, I love creativity, but not in my class, you know, so yeah. that, 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 that's a lot. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of it, too, is as educators, I think part of what we um, is our responsibility is helping young people know that there there are different contexts that are going to be more welcoming and or less welcoming of creative expression, and so part of it is you know we've talked about like creative metacognition, so knowing how to read the environment and knowing that even though your idea might not fit in this particular environment, there could be another environment that that could happen. So the idea of, of a, maybe a young person writing a sonnet um, during a math exam <laughs> on the exam, you know, it's, it's not to, you know, and some teachers might be okay with that. Most probably wouldn't because they want to see like, can this kid kind of uh, show me math in this kind of expected way, but that doesn't mean that should be stifled. It just could be redirected. And there, you know, it reminds me, you brought up jazz, you know, Miles Davis has this absolutely beautiful quote that says, when you hit a wrong note, Right. And so he was talking about jazz, but we could think about this in education. It's the next note you play that determines whether it's good or bad. So it's really about helping young people understand not only setbacks, but, you know, what do we do next? And what are the contexts where this can flourish? And, you know, I think we have to do this. Those of us that are parents, you know, I remember my daughter um, asked in her third grade <laughs> math class, they were studying time. They were getting ready to do time worksheets. And the teacher asked before they before the teacher passed out the worksheets, does anybody have any questions about time? And my daughter said, where's the time from yesterday go? And so the teacher wasn't happy about that. And my, 
my daughter had passed a note in that class calling it a worksheet factory and how she hated it in there. <laughs> and so I thought that was great, but she didn't understand why I would think that was great and her teacher didn't. And so we had to have this conversation. Well, in the context of the car, that's great, but you're not in a philosophy seminar. This is third grade math. There's an expectation. And so it doesn't mean you give up those ideas. It's just not the right form for exploring those, right? So being able to read that environment uh, and kind of do that both and. And I think um, successful creators do that. And of course, successful creators also know when to be disruptive and to change an environment. So it is, it's always a risk. And I think part of it is young people have to be able to develop their confidence um, in their own creativity, value creativity as part of their identity, and then ultimately be willing to take the risk and, and know when it, it may pay out in a particular context with a particular audience and when it may not and not be deterred by that, but just realize this might not be a good fit. You know, one, one thing I just want to highlight is uh, uh, creativity is, it can be what you have, also can be the results of what you yeah. have. And that, that is actually very important. Like, you know, we talk about creativity, you know, when we define it as something original, that means you've already produced something versus you have the capacity to produce something different. I think we, we get confused quite a lot, actually, even in creativity assessment, you know, what are you assessing, you know? So that that's, uh, so there's a bunch of great articles, in, I mean, in this issue. So, so I really hope people would read them and uh, say what happens. And so they, uh, I think we're gonna move on to our next issue and, uh, um, and Kurt, you can ask a question next. Uh, so the, the next issue we are right now, uh, well, feel free to submit your proposals. It's focus on the side effects of education. So uh, I started thinking about that side effects, but so many, many years ago, but then I end up writing a book about side effects. I just copied that on the YouTube uh, um, uh, channel for about that. So what are side effects? It really came from uh, my observation of uh, uh, of what we call evidence-based. You know, like we've been talking about evidence-based practice, evidence-based policy making, evidence-based instruction, evidence-based, there's so much evidence. I said, what the heck evidence are you talking about? So then I went back to, to look at, uh, for example, evidence, why international tests like PISA uh, and TIMS would show countries with high test scores, but have lower uh, non-cognitive uh, effects. So like he was saying, so actually Tom Loveless, some of you may know, wrote that first. I re read that article. I, mean, I think Tom Loveless used to be at Harvard and he, he, he wrote, he said, okay, why do Asian students have lower confidence in their math, but have higher test scores? And this is wrote for the Brookings. And, but Americans have higher confidence, but lower math scores. And his conclusion was that Americans are too confident so I took that, said, you know, should we make American kids more miserable so they can have better test scores? So I kind of dived into that. So in the end, I mean, the, the whole book and uh, several articles I wrote about this is really, you have side effects in many places. For example, cognitive versus non-cognitive. You could be studying, you could get very good results on tests, but you actually hate the subjects. Now, is that worth it? Is that worth it? Another thing is we call the, the short term versus long term. For example, you we, we you know I actually whole, did a whole chapter on direct instruction. Direct instruction may deliver you immediate better outcomes. I teach you this not inquiry based, but then delete, de, uh, that, that may not last into next year. So and if some learning can last much longer time versus short term, which one is more worth it? Another one we can call it side effects in education outcomes versus instructional outcomes. Now, like in instruction, we always have our instruction outcomes. I'm teaching you this, and I'm assessing you this week on the end of the semester. But if you are like in third grade, as use third grade as the example, if you kind of well, wrong your daughter, maybe if the teacher tolerated that creativity and praised her. Versus trying to say, you know, suppressor, now you got to memorize my math, you know. And yes, she might have memorized the math, but she becomes disengaged from this. 
and she loses creativity. Is that worth it? So it kind of, you know, so there, there are a lot of things about evidence. The evidence in, in the end, also people talk about, you know, is like in vaccination. If you collect evidence of only how the medicine has helped versus those might have hurt. You know, in education, we know a lot. And we always talk about effect sizes. You know, to get a point, effects of 25, you could get rain. Half of the students hurting from the methods the other half doing better. So is that good? You know, a medicine like vaccination, if you killed three people and um, kind of helped seven people, is that good? So in education, where does this come from? Anyway, so, so that is the, uh, the idea of side effects and how we are trying to collect more people from philosophically, more data, and to raise the question that the side effects is the other side of the coin. You cannot really avoid. It's not only just unexpected outcomes, you could expect some outcomes. So that is where, how we started. And uh, we are now collecting you know, submissions, proposals for our next issue. Go ahead, Chris. Um, Ponyo, if you have a quick comment, you can go first. Yeah, I just wanted to just say, I mean, um, recently <clears throat> somebody brought up this whole issue of this reading wars that's going on right now phonics versus whole language and so on. And for me, the example that I gave was exactly this. I made that point, which is that, you know, yes, there are some students who absolutely need X and there are some students who would thrive under Y. And, but if you think of a one sort of approach for all, you will end up with some students who are gonna hate reading or other group of students who will never learn reading. And, you know, so anyway, so just uh, the idea resonates. Let me just put it that way. So Kurt, uh, Chris, sorry, go ahead. Well, we know that there's lots of ways of biasing evidence. Um, one of my colleagues um, used an example about the fact that dolphins, you know, seem to help people when they're drowning, you know, they'll push them towards shore. And he pointed out that, that from a statistical point of view, that's completely erroneous because the dolphins could push people in random directions. And the ones they pushed away from shore never tell the tale about the dolphins. So, um, you know, th there's lots, lots and lots of flaws in a lot of papers that are published that are evidence-based, but have, have messed up somewhere in the complex process. I've, I've um, gotten into trouble in ed tech conferences actually making a comment about side effects because somebody will say, look at this, you know, I've got a, a, a small, a moderate level of significance and I've got this wonderful technology based solution and I don't understand why people aren't implementing it. And I'll say, well, um, in the short run, at least it's a zero sum game, right? You can raise teacher salaries. You can make sure the teachers have enough materials without spending out of their own pockets. You can lower class sizes. You know, you can have more professional development or you can buy this technology and implement it. So it's not just saying the technology would be positive. You actually have to say it would be more positive than other ways of spending the money. And that's something you very seldom hear, not just at ed tech conferences, but at any kind of conferences that center on any kind of innovation. There's not this sense of the side effect that if you spend money on one thing, it's not there for something else. Well, you know, Chris, one thing, you know, the federal government under No Child Left Behind actually has built up what works clearinghouse, which never says anything about side effects, right? And we just, so if you go, well, it's, it's a lot of money. It's $5 million a year at least. And so, so that is a lot of said, we are relying on evidence and then federal money is distributed based on what we call collected evidence. So, so that is, is quite actually a, a dangerous move in, in terms of that. And another thing I can point out when you were talking about uh, reading, uh, if you go through a reading wars and math wars, it's quite funny. It's everybody claims to be the best. And so, and everybody would like to be the best. So they will always get some support. And then once they become the best, the other side collects evidence to say, no, you are not the best. And then other people will come in and say, gradually, we, you know, we call it a pendulum swing, right? Because, you know, every 
every method has problems. So, but but that problem can be ignored when you are so condemning, you are so kind of abandoning other methods. So you move on. That's why the side effect, you know, this whole thing moves on. Because so, we do not allow people to bring side effects to our own thing. We only point to other people. We don't, sure. we never accept ourselves. Go ahead, Pony. No, I think there is another interesting thing here, which is to do with the messiness of the data and the act of interpretation itself that is foundational to the work that we do. I mean, if you look at all of these studies, you know, things about like, you know, can we evaluate score teachers based on performance of students and all that. And just recently I read about this where uh, they did this MRI study where they shared that data. I'll put a link in the chat here. Uh, I just found a Vox article about it. And they shared that data with 70 different researchers, same data, same hypothesis. And these researchers came up with different, you know, acceptance and rejection of the hypothesis. I mean, this is MRI that we are talking about where there is a lot, well, one, one assumes there is a lot more certainty about this, right? And so I think that there is a bigger point here about, there is the, the point about that there are these side effects, but also of recognizing the field that we are in and the nature of data in that in this field is so much more complicated. Um, I mean, so if you look at what works clearing or that, I was reminded of that Zara, because you mentioned that. I went looking once what kinds of ed tech studies have made it to the what's work clearing house because they have a bar for studies need to be of such and such a nature and so on. And the only, this is a few years back, the only one I found was some specific math and reading software, which most probably doesn't exist anymore in this world today because the technology has moved on. And so how we approach research in the first place, I think is an important question there um, that we, sh we should be really thinking about. Yeah, thank Kurt. you, Punya. Uh, Ron, go ahead. Uh, and so for this issue, what we're really trying to get at is to invite a much more kind of nuanced view of side effects. So, um, you know, in a former life, I was a program evaluator when I was at Indiana. I worked for the Indiana Center for Evaluation. And something I learned there, um, which would be a starting point for like a what works clearinghouse, you know, the mantra in evaluation is always what works for whom at what costs and in what context. So if there was a clearinghouse that was willing to kind of have that huge <laughs> title, <laughs> then it would be a start down in that direction. But I, I agree, I think, so what we're looking for is contributions that are really gonna look at a much broader perspective on side effects. So for example, yes, what do our current methodologies and research practices offer us? A lot of the research that we, you know, make claims on is based on on average research, right? So sometimes that's going to get, that'll give you kind of a broad overview, but it doesn't necessarily always pertain to a particular case or a particular context. And I think keeping that in mind. Um, and so inviting people to think about that. And so I'll appeal to an example in creativity research, because that's kind of where most of where I live is in creativity research. One of the methodologies in creativity research, which is, you know, used often and often pointed to as a, a really important and viable method was de developed by Teresa Mobley at Harvard Business School. But the idea is if you're assessing creative products, you bring in a panel of experts, they independently assess it on creativity without any rubric or even definition of creativity and their expertise offers the validity. And often, and then you look at the, the reliability of those ratings and they're often um, highly reliable. And so you have your kind of validity and reliability in that judgment. But even that technique is looking at what I would call unambiguous creativity. So some colleagues and I have, have um, op opened a conversation about this methodology itself. So what it provides you with is seemingly unambiguous creative artifacts and unambiguous non-creative artifacts. But if we were to be true to creativity, which is about difference, so it's really about consensus amongst experts. But what about those artifacts that um, the experts don't agree on? That turns into statistical noise, right? That just gets kind of shunted away. So what we're inviting folks to do is take a second look at those. That's a side effect of a methodology that could be leaving a lot of potential creativity on the table just because a group of experts do not come to consensus about this is creative or this is not creative. So that's what we're hoping people would do is try to think about methodologies and the side effects of using methodologies that seem 
really kind of promising and have delivered a, a long program of research, not to throw those out, but to talk about what's missing and what's the, what's the potential side effects for good or bad that these methodologies can kind of leave us with. In addition to that, what about teaching young people about side effects? So the idea of principled innovation, which is an ASU idea or principled creativity, when you're inviting young people to do something, even if it's a service learning project, oftentimes the focus is on what they take away. But what if we also invited young people to think about, are you depleting already depleted resources in a context so you can have a learning experience? What are the side effects of your service learning project, especially if you just, pull up everything and leave after right. 15 weeks, right? So what if we had young people start thinking in much more principled ways? So I think side effects is really about taking a principled approach to research, to teaching, to learning, to any innovative projects. And so that's what we're trying again to do in this issue is just really broaden the horizon of what do we mean by side effects and what does it offer us to think about these in much more nuanced and careful ways. And by the way, uh, uh, just to add before Kurt jumps in, is that side effects can be positive too. Okay, so it doesn't mean it has to be negative. Uh, we've been highlighting the negative side effects, but side effects occasionally can be good. You know, it does not have to be bad, but they have typically not been studied. Kurt. Yeah. Um, so I've been working on a special issue, actually, the second, and we're about to work on the third. I'm working with a, a former student an alum of IU, about your time when you were here, Ron, her name is Vanessa Denon, and she's now at Florida State. She was an IST major. Uh, her and me and Florence Martin at NC State did an issue for ETRD on emerging technologies, and now we're doing one for OLJ, Online Learning Journal, and we're about to do one for Vanessa's journal, The Internet and Higher Education, on faculty development, uh, PD issues in online learning. So I just want to comment, and I have a question for you. You do these special issues. So the young people are going to watch the show, but why do people do special issues? You know, um, you know, do they just get together over coffee and tea and say, well, we just should do this? Well, they're, they're purposeful in many ways. You know, in some, some aspects is to form a network among people that you can just discuss ideas in and amongst yourselves and maybe have a symposium that shoots out of the special issue that wherein you can highlight um, the articles that are in the special issue. Uh, part of it is to find the rising stars in the field and to support, support them in one way, shape, or form. And when you improve the papers, as the people do the special issues, we're involved in improving each of the papers that go in them. You have, you've, you've gained friends for life because you've helped support them in many ways in an important article that they're writing. But you're also fleshing out your own ideas, your own thinking in the field and pushing your pushing yourself, challenging yourself to be up to par with all these others that you brought in as part of the special issue. And, and normally you don't bring people in, you offer a call for papers, and then you select the ones that, that percolate to the top after maybe a couple rounds of reviews of early ideas and so forth. But you can also set new directions with the special issue. You can also comment on where the field should be going after at the end of the special issue in a final kind of summative article, if you will. You can also frame the special issue in different distinct categories or maybe or phases of the research that have been ongoing that you've, you've picked up on as a result of the special issue or you wanted to talk about even before you had the idea of the special issue, you've had some ideas in your mind about the field that this special issue enables you to get out and, and, and get feedback from others who are also exploring similarly within the field. And you might find some people that you initially didn't even know were doing research in this area uh, at maybe a remote private college somewhere and they become part of your network then. Um, so it's purposeful. It's to set new directions. It's to see what's happening in the field and to kind of um, shape the field in some way, shape or form. So I want you each to do is I want you each to talk about a person, a rising star that appeared in either the last special issue or the one you're working on. Um, could you tell us about someone or, or, or an article that really uh, you recommend people should read? It's, it's a mind-blowing uh, piece yeah. of research. Well, Kurt, uh, you, you are much more thoughtful uh, than I was. 
So, uh, so Juan <laughs> and I, we, we were not near as thoughtful about why we want to do this. So uh, first of all, these are not special issues. These are the AERA, American Education Research Association's regular journals. Right, but, but, but it journal is in runs, effect. This journal, they run each year, they run one issue. Yeah. So um, when they invited me and Ron to submit a proposal, we simply, I think it's wrong, I'm speaking on your behalf. We simply want to bring these two issues to the broader field of education because this journal has a wide reach. So we just say, okay, there are two things we think we need. So we have not had your kind of personal contact with authors. We would not, we don't question them. We don't ask them. We never, we just <laughs> traded emails and uh, we just want it as broad as possible uh, a field reactions to these two issues we want to talk about. So sorry, I cannot name, you know, I, I wouldn't even remember all the names of the authors. <laughs> so, so I did not have any personal contact with them, you know. Ron, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, Kurt, what you're highlighting is that there are side effects <laughs> of special <laughs> issues, right? And thematic issues. I think the thing that's interesting about them is, you know, most journals, publish articles that come in. And so it's, they're not necessarily thematic. So, you know, as you read through, if you, if you have the, the uh, patience to read through an entire volume of a journal from, you know, cover to cover, it's going to be, you know, the topic's going to be all over the place. I mean, they might be in a, in a particular kind of area in general, but, but I think what a special issue and a thematic issue offers is you know, kind of a, a concentrated espresso shot that can have those kind of emergent properties that you're describing. And so part of it is it's hard to kind of, you know, <laughs> answer the questions you asked because it, this is a, this is a, has a temporal component to it. Things that, and again, it's a, it's a side effect thing. Things that you think might be, wow, you know, transformative now may be, may take on a different character in the future, right? And things that, I think this is another thing that we need to think about with respect to side effects, that um, they have a temporal component to them. And depending on the audience and the context and how the audience engage with them, then they can kind of take on different things. So retrospectively is when, when we often see and make, determinations about things after time has passed. But I think that they do have this kind of unique quality um, in academia where a special issue really does have a chance to bring new voices in, and which is what we did try to do deliberately by opening the call to as many different um, methodological traditions as possible and to, to even invite people to be speculative, I think which, is, which sometimes feels like something that's not allowed in academia. But those speculations aren't just wild guesses. They are kind of funded by prior experience and, and expertise. But I think it's important, especially as we're thinking towards making future directed impacts, what could or should the field look at? And so I think that's what a special issue does is it helps you think about what currently is the case and where could it or should it be going? And I think it's kind of a collective effort that has all these wonderful emergent properties that can have, you know, these kind of positive side effects that we can't even anticipate, you know, even just a few months out after publication or even through the process. But it's exciting to see. I think it's, you know, I, I think to, it's a creative process. I have to add uh, one thing. This is actually quite interesting. You know, Ron, you, Ron's been a journal editor, chief editor for God decades now, you know, so, uh, you know, just, so, so for me, actually, I, I saw them edit things you know so so this was actually almost among one of the first things i did you know with for, for a big organization and the what i really found interesting kurt is that uh, i kind of ignore the authors I, I go to the content i go to the ideas you know i was really like i was not you know we were really just dealing with the content just to say broad diverse cutting edge. That was really, thin, and that pushes me, pushes the field. And now, uh, Chris, you have a comment. Go ahead. Well, I just want to observe that what is the primary effect and what are the side effects change over time. Uh, and an example is the automobile. The automobile was originally adopted because horses generated a lot of poop, which was pollution, and because you could go faster, in theory, from place to place with an automobile. Um, now in Boston, 
much of the time, you can't go faster than a horse would go, maybe not faster than a walking person would go. We've got a side effect of pollution that's actually creating climate change, which is much more dramatic than anything that horse food was capable of doing. We've got a dependence on foreign oil. You've got the distinction between the city and the suburbs. You can go on and on and on and on. The primary effect has been largely lost. And because the side effects were unanticipated, people really didn't know what they were getting into. I mean, it was a kind of a Faustian bargain, as you as you referenced earlier. The modern <clears throat> the modern equivalent, and I've written about this, is social media. You know, the original concept behind social media was, you know, it's a way of keeping connections across the distance, which is great. But look at what social media has turned into, you know, fake news, the ability to tailor your reality so that you only pay attention to things that reinforce your point of view, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the primary effect has been overwhelmed by, in many cases, negative side effects, although there have been some positive ones as well. So I think we have to be careful. What, what we need to say is that anytime you do something with technology, the probability of unanticipated consequences is high. They could be positive, they could be negative. But to go back to our creativity example, it would really be helpful if we could anticipate more of them. You know, um, that is actually a, a, a great comment about how times change, how, how times and when things change, what used to matter don't matter anymore. So I'm, I'm really reminded of uh, how the main effects of education as judged by governments, by education policy makers, which is the reading scores and math scores haven't changed much. Yesterday, you know, there was ABC reporting talk about how SAT scores have dropped and the people talk about how SAT have dropped, all of those things. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the issue is this, you, you want, I want to really just ask ourselves, has educational research, education reforms, all the changes made even any difference in the main effects, let alone the possible side effects? In one of the things, for example, standardized testing, does it make students more compliant? We don't know. You know, we guess, we, we think it might be, but we don't know, right? You know, in, in order to do well in standardized testing, do you have to be more compliant? We, we, we have no evidence to, of, of that. And there is some study, uh, for example, showing to say standardized testing can depress students, can scare students, can, can make them pee during testing for younger kids, like third graders, you know. So, so, so those, are, I think all of this, we need to bring, like Punia was talking about, the complexity of research into this. I, I, I'm very worried about in education, we arrive at very simplistic answers, you know, especially with statistics. I'm sure you know, we all, all agree with the statistic gives you this, you know, the p-value of 0.001. Oh my God, that's great. We got an effect size of 0.8. Oh my God, that's, so I'm really worried about that kind of, you know, uh, reporting in educational research. So um, I know Kurt has to introduce the next episode, but uh, I just wanted to share this. So Ron, I love that piece you talked about when you get this experts consensus. Um, and I was reminded of, I mean, if you look, I mean, the history of, of, of science and ideas is full of people who came up with ideas which the expertise at that moment did not see as being creative, right? And the example that came to mind immediately was the Indian mathematician Ramanujan, who sent, who was sort of completely self-taught a mathematician based on some books that he had found. So he was literally inventing math while he was creating it, sent his scribblings to a bunch of mathematicians across the world. And the only person who responded to him was this English mathematician by the name of Hardy. And if you go look at the story of Hardy and Ramanujan, it's fascinating because Hardy is reading this and he's talking to Littlewood, who's another mathematician, and the argument is, is this is crazy. Is it crazy, like batshit crazy, or is it crazy, genius crazy? And that's the judgment that 
Hardy had to make. And he was the only person who responded back to Ramanujan. And then Ramanujan came, worked in England, and then of course died very young and all of that. But that's that's that outlier where a whole bunch of mathematicians got it and thought, hey, this is batshit crazy because we get these kinds of things all the time. Somebody who has solved the time space, whatever, uh, you know, or Fermat's last conjecture or whatever it may be. Um, and so that was a very, int- that's a good example, I think, of the point that you were trying to make. And I was just reminded of that. Well, this is a conversation we should definitely have over in a bar for like three days. These uh, this are uh, very tough issues, but interesting to, uh, to pursue. So anyway, uh, thank you, Ron. And Kurt, you introduce next episode. Ron, you want to say something before I introduce Nick? Up? I was just going to say thank you for having me. This has been a very interesting and provocative conversation. So thank you. There are blues clubs in Chicago and AERA will be there in April. We could all have a meetup and all prior guests of the show should join us, uh, you know, either Kingston Mines or House of Blues or Buddy Guys. So I need to introduce the next show. And it is a special show because it's going to build on this. Uh, we will hear from Vicki Colbert, who 30 years ago helped create the Escuela Nueva schools in Colombia, which now extends around the world. And she's won a wise innovation prize for the uh, projects uh, over over the lifespan. Um, it not just helps boost kids' basic skills, but self-esteem, creativity, civics, and many other things. It's a child-centered approach to education. So it'll be a kind of a fun conversation that we'll have with Vicki, descri- letting her describe what's happened. And um, oh, next week, we'll be at 4.30 Eastern, I think. Uh, it will be an hour earlier in Colombia, uh, but we're at 3.30 or 4.30 Eastern. I'll be coming to you from Las Vegas at ACT. You want to check the, the website, though, because that time may change. Uh, I have to contact Vicky again just to confirm that. So thank you all. We'll see you next time. An episode.